Hi everyone, Dr. Danielle Ward here. Wanted to take the time on this beautiful Sunday to make a quick video for you guys regarding compiling your application after not matching successfully. One of the things I get asked about a lot is how did I submit applications to programs as they listed open positions post-match, post-soap, when ERAS wasn't open. I've talked about in prior videos that I had a 40-page PDF application and everyone's always curious what exactly was in that application. So this video will be a brief overview of me going over everything that was in that application to hopefully guide those who may need it. I did write some notes down because it's hard, easy for me to forget. So I'll just briefly, if you see me looking down, I'm looking at my book. But the first part of the application was my headshot. Big picture of myself underneath said Daniel Ward, D-O-M-S. This may or may not be important, but I did notice when I was interviewing off cycle and I would show up at a residency program, and mind you, this was for pre-COVID interviews, they knew immediately who I was. So that was kind of cool where the coordinator would say, oh, I recognized you from the application that you sent in. So I started off my application with just the big picture of myself and my name so that they knew exactly who I was. And I had my credentials, the DO for Plastics World may or may not have hurt me, but I wanted to make sure they knew what I looked like and who I was. So that was page one. Page two through six was my CV. So just the generic template for the CV I use, the first part is personal, where you put your name, your address, your email address, your phone number. The second part is education. So you wanna put where you went to college, medical school. For me, because I did do an intern year, I had that under that part as well. The next section, I listed certification and licensure. So that was where I put my ATLS, ACLS, BLS, my licenses that I had and the expiration dates on them so that they could see that I was up to date on everything and that I did have my medical license. Next was my research and work experience only from medical school and beyond. Don't put anything from college, but I did have all the research that I did as a medical student, all the jobs that I had taken since then. I was currently in urgent care, so I put that part in there. And then the next part I had, my honors and awards section. I think it's important to show your accolades. One of my awards was a Founders Day medal from my institution that's only given to like one student on each campus per year. It's one of the highest honors you could achieve. So I wanted to make sure that they saw that. I also included leadership positions. For me, when I was an intern after not matching, I was actually one of the chief interns. So it was more of an administrative role, answering questions for all the interns, I'm reporting back to program directors, sitting in monthly GME meetings. So it was important to note that in addition to my medical school leadership positions, as anyone who has read my blog knows that I've had national president positions, committee chairs, I wanted to highlight all of that. So that is in my CV. And then I listed professional memberships. It was important for me to list that because I am a member of Society of Black Academic Surgeons and American College of Surgeons. So it's those memberships show that I am surgery oriented, that I wasn't just applying to apply, that this is something that I've been doing for a while. For the next section, I broke it down a little bit differently than most people would do it. I have a peer reviewed publication section. These are research articles that you can find of me on PubMed that are indexed. So I had that as its own separate section because those are easy to find. But then I also had, of course, a books authored section because I wrote my own book. I had other publications and media appearances. This wasn't too significant in a residency scheme, but I was, you know, I showed up on TV as an on-air medical expert. I thought that was important. I was contributing to journals that were not peer reviewed, so they don't carry as much weight, but I wanted to make sure that people knew that I was contributing in some way. So that was all a part of my CV, which is why the CV section was about five to six pages long. And then for other research, I did have research contributed to and research presentations in the form of posters as its own separate section. Keep in mind, before medical school, I was a research associate for four years. So there was a lot of research involved with that. Lots of poster presentations, but then there was also work that I took part in that was presented 
in other countries by the postdoctoral fellow that my name was a part of. So I wanted to make sure that people saw that my work was presented in France or this country. So that's all a part of my CV. And then lastly, I had invited presentations. A lot of times I get invited to speak. So when before matching into plastics, I think the most recent was in Atlanta. I went to Morehouse School of Medicine and gave a presentation on studying for boards. I include stuff like that in that section. And then the last part, I just put conferences attended and professional development. The conferences attended, not so much important, but I, that's what I wanted my CV to reflect. So my CV was five pages of my application, but as you can see, there's a lot that I've done over the years that I felt was important to have included. The next two pages of my application were my personal statement. This was the same statement that I used when I applied to residency. The only difference is that after completing my intern year, I did tweak my personal statement to reflect what I learned as an intern, how that is enhancing my ability to be a great surgeon, and how I wish to move forward in my career in surgery based off the intern year. So that's how I tweaked my personal statement. The next three to four pages were my personal statements. So pro tip on the personal statements. A lot of times when you apply through ERAS, that's the residency application service, you waive your right to view your letters of recommendation. But when you're applying off cycle, it's very hard to keep asking your letter writers to send in these letters for you to the different programs. I mean, I applied to maybe hundreds of different programs over the years and it just would have been a nuisance. So for me, I reached out to my letter writers and I asked them if they'd be comfortable sending me a PDF of the letter that they originally wrote for me and all of them were fine with it. And of course the letter had their contact information, their email, their phone number, so all of it could have been verified. It was on letterhead, but I had these letters and I submitted them with my application and it was really helpful because I didn't have to keep bugging them every week for a different program. So just the pro tip, I know through ERAS we waive our right to see the letter, but once you have it matched through ERAS, once you have it matched through the SOAP, at this point, get those letters, do what you have to do to expedite the process. Because when you're applying outside the SOAP, there's a lot of others applying too, and I can guarantee they have their stuff together. The next few pages were my medical student performance evaluations. This is MSPE. This is an evaluation that they give you towards the end of medical school that highlights how you did on different core rotations like internal medicine, general surgery. It has comments from the preceptors. So this was important to just highlight so I did include those pages in my application. The next three pages were my official medical school transcript. That way they could see every class I'd ever taken, every grade that I had made. There would be no question on that. And then for page 21, that was my a copy of my actual medical school diploma and then for page 22 that was a copy of my graduation certificate from my traditional rotating internship year. 23 to 24 I had my COMLEX transcript. For those who don't know I'm a doctor of osteopathic medicine. I took the COMLEX so that's what was included in my application and I did the transcript instead of the actual score report because the transcript actually shows any attempts you may have taken at the exam in addition to your scores. Whereas with the score report, you could easily hide if you had failed an exam or something. So I want to make sure they had the transcript to know that I passed everything on the first attempt and to know what my original scores were. You do have to pay a small fee to get this transcript, but it's worth it just to have it. For my next pages, 25 to 27, this was actual copies of my certification. So I had my ATLS card, the Advanced Trauma Life Support card included. I had my ACLS, my BLS, copies of those were included in my application so that they know would know that I did in fact have this certification. For pages 28 to 31, this was my ACGME milestone report. This was from my previous program. It basically just shows how you were doing as a resident, if there were any things that you could have worked on or things that you excelled at. It's just the formality that every program does, so I made sure to include that. And then for my final 
30, pages 32 to 43, I started off with a list of my rotations for page 32, so they can know everything I had done during my intern year. And then for the remaining 10 pages, I had all of my case logs. So every single case I ever scrubbed that first year was included in my application. I think that first year it was very busy. I think maybe I had 150 cases, which is funny compared to being here. I think I hit way over 200 last year, but I did make sure I included that just so they could see what I was actually scrubbing in on. That's pretty much the complete 43 application package that I submitted to programs every time I saw an opening. And I know some of you were wondering where exactly was I applying? How was I finding out about these open positions? Well, here are the main ones I use. I know a few have changed. One was unmatchedmd.com, which I checked the other day, it seems like it's now for pay, but before it was actually a free service where they would list every single day when there was an open position. I used resident swap just to see where any positions would open, but I did find that by the time it made it to resident swap, it was already on another site that I was following and I had already completed my application. So you can take it on yourself if it's worth to pay the three month fee for that. And then I did the Association of Program Directors and Surgery website, that's APDS, and they have, you can go on today, they have positions that open daily. You'll see prelim PGY2 positions, you'll see categorical positions, you'll even see PGY1 positions. This is all in surgery, but I would stock that site every single day. And when I saw something, I mean, I was submitting my application within seconds of seeing it. So that's why it's important to have the application that I discussed. And then I put it all in one PDF file, made it very easy for whoever I was sending it to, to look at. As for other sites, ACAPS, the American Council of Academic Plastic Surgeons, if you type in ACAPS, A-C-A-P-S, open positions into your browser, Usually every now and then you'll see where they have maybe a PGY2 position open in plastic surgery. I think when I looked the other week, they had a PGY3 position open. So these were the sites that I was looking at every day. And of course there was word of mouth. So people would tell me if their programs had an opening or even in Facebook groups, I would find out openings from that. So that's pretty much the application that I developed. I know one PDF of 43 pages might be a bit overkill, but you have to understand that I am a medical school graduate who had not matched more than once. So it wasn't overkill for me. I wanted to put all my cards out on the table. I wanted people to see what they were getting into. I didn't want to leave any stone unturned. And it made it easy for me because coordinators didn't have to email me and say, well, where's this score or where's that? I did get a few questions on the USMLE, which I did not include, but I let them know that I am a DO and I was applying with COMLEX scores. Of course, that probably hurt me, but you know, when you get to a certain point, it's just... But that's pretty much it for my application. I hope this helps some of you who might have had an unsuccessful match season. Just keep an eye out for open programs. Know that it's still early in the game. I know for those who recently went unmatched, it might feel like all hope is lost, but these programs are listing sites daily. Also keep in mind that with the matching process, the obligation is 45 days to a program. So typically you'll see a lot more openings come around September, October, after that 45 day mark when people can get out of their contract. So keep in mind in the fall, you might see some open programs as well. But if anyone watching this has any tips for those who are unmatched when it comes to submitting their applications, making themselves successful, please leave it in the comments below. As always, thank you guys for watching my channel. If you like what you see, please hit the subscribe button. And until next time, I hope everybody has a great week.